Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hi, Dolly. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, it's Monday evening, so the week is beginning, and uh, yep. yeah, we're going to have well, fun. Yeah. I'm just going to call out the calls real quick. We're broadcasting to you from UPRN in the lovely city of New Orleans and uh, United Paranormal Network also, uh, 107.7 FM and 105.3 FM. And uh, we're sorry for starting a few minutes late, but, you know, every now and then something happens. And go, Preston. We got a guest. All right. Yeah. This is episode number four of The Light Gate. As you know, I'm Preston Dennett author, researcher, and my co-host is Dolly Safran, experiencer extraordinaire, subject of the book Symmetry, and our guest tonight I'm super excited about. It's someone I've known for some time, and she's a really nice person and has some amazing experiences to tell. She's actually an experiencer, an investigator, and an author, and her name is Dev Rooney. And she actually has over 40 years of UFO research and independent investigative experience. She became interested in UFOs at an early age, which we'll talk about, and has had many sightings and paranormal experiences. Her main interest has been, as she says, the abduction phenomena. We call it the contactee phenomena. <laughs> uh, she has a very high interest in close encounter cases with unknown craft. But yeah, she's also studied many other topics, uh, such as the Robert Monroe Institute, Dogmen, and more. After moving up to Portland, Oregon, Dev rejoined MUFON in January of 2008, MUFON being the Mutual UFO Network. And she became the Oregon MUF. MUFON Chief Investigator. And she moved back to Northern California in 2010 and became a section state director for seven counties. And then get this, became the chief investigator later that year and is now the assistant state director and is on the MUFON star team. So she's spoken at many MUFON chapter meetings, conferences, lots of UFO shows and podcasts. It's been on a couple of TV shows, and is the author of the very well-received book, all five-star reviews, by the way. It's called UFO Investigator, A Personal Look into Circumstance, Investigations, and Discovery. So we'll be talking about that as well. Yeah, I'm super excited to have her on. So let's just bring on Dev Rooney. <laughs> Hi, Dev. <laughs> Hi, Preston. Hi, Dolly. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's our pleasure. Yeah, your, your speaker sounds great. So I think oh, we're <laughs> we're ready to go. I know how to pronounce your last name, so I'm even more excited about that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you've got, you know, I was going through your book. Yeah, as I said, very well received on Amazon. That's super exciting. I love the cover. Um, a wonderful title as well. <laughs> so I, I love to that. But uh, yeah, you know, I all, what I love diving into first, because I'm so curious about this, because my I came in into this field as a complete skeptic, did not believe in UFOs at all. And I always wonder what draws people into this field. And we just touched on it in your bio, your introduction. So I was wondering if you could let us all know how you got involved with UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wrote this book to kind of talk about not only the fact that being a UFO investigator uh, was very key in my life, still is very much, but I also wanted to kind of explain who I was and how it really impacted me to become an investigator uh, because something had happened when I was 11 years old and uh, not to date myself, but it was 1969. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> that summer, you know, I was just like any other kid playing outside. And uh, we had this big tree in our, our front yard. And uh, I was always in it, hanging out. Uh, spying on the other kids, that kind of thing. And I felt like 
you know, I was one of those tall, really skinny kids that when I was always in that tree, I was kind of in the middle of the, the trunk, you know, like secure. I was not going to fall out or anything. I was up there every day and for hours. And But this one time, what was strange was I found myself, I, I was up in the tree and the next moment I found myself about six feet away on the ground, kind of coming into contact, like waking up. And, you know, when you're a kid, um, you're not stupid. You you know, hey, wait, I, I, I was up in the tree and then I I was waking up kind of like, well, how did I get here? And uh, I quickly got up and I was wearing shorts and I was brushing myself off. Uh, I was uh, on the grass still, but it was what was interesting was this tree in the yard, whoever plant they whoever planted this tree, because it was a pretty big tree. Right. It was put on a man-made mound. Okay. And so I would say it was about two feet, two and a half feet uh the the mound itself that the tree was in that was planted. Okay. And it was a big, you know, big tree. The outside of this mound was, there was, it was like a dark gray, like coral rock. It had these tiny little holes in it. And um, it was kind of sharp a little bit, you know, it was very interesting the way it was, how they had built it. So I knew as I was standing there, I was up in the tree and I thought to myself, I walked up to the tree going, if I fell, why did I, why was I way over here? And if I fell, I would have just came straight down and I would have hit that coral rock. I would have been hurt. I would have had, you know, mark, scrape marks and everything. Yeah, and I, that's what I, was going to ask. Yeah. I knew no way, no way did I fall. Cause I had no memory of falling just waking up and I didn't understand what was happening. So it was funny is that um, that was the summer that we went to the moon. It was 1969. And I know that it was after the fact it, so that the moon landing, the it was in July. So this this incident had to have happened prior to July. So maybe it was June. But because and how I really thought about this was after this incident of waking up and, and not knowing what happened to me, I really started to feel uh, like um, I started doing this kind of thing where I was climbing the roof of the house. And, and laying up on the roof, watching the sky. And my mother was just freaking out and always yelling at me to get off the roof. And I wasn't listening. I kept going back up and she kept- It sounds just like you, Dolly, when you were a kid. We were, <laughs> both, we, we were both tree climbers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my mother finally was really upset with me saying, why do you keep going up there? And I, she goes, what are you doing up there? I said laying there looking at the sky she goes why she was very upset and um i said well i'm not hurting anything she said we're renting this house and the landlady we you know the landlady she was trying to explain to me i'm 11 that <laughs> she, my mother kept saying well what if you fell through the roof i mean never mind that i got hurt she was more worried that the landlady would kick us out or whatever and i and i didn't understand what was really kind of going on with that um, but I think later on we, we had a discussion about it when I got older that she said, well, we were really upset. Uh, we were, they were kind of afraid of the landlady in a way because she didn't want too many, she didn't want someone that lived there that had too many kids and they were, she was worried about the property and, you know, kids destroying stuff. And so my mom was just trying to tell me, you know, like, 
stay off the roof because if we mess up this house, we, we have to get out, you know, in a sense. But I just told her because she had said, well, what's the reason going up there? And I said, well, I want to watch the sky. And hmm. I felt that if I was up on the roof, I would be closer to the sky in a sense where I wouldn't have anything obstructing my view in a sense. Because she kept saying, well, just lay on the ground, <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. But I was really starting to get really uh, interested in all of those 50s movies, you know, Earth versus the Flying Saucers. And I was begging her to watch watch them on a Saturday. And she was like, no, go outside and plan. This is my day to clean the house, this kind of thing. And I was just so obsessed with UFOs and all that. Well, well, this is and, a pattern I do see a lot with contactees. You know, after a first yeah. experience, they start to develop an interest. Well, that certainly was true with me. I know it's true with Dolly. You were like an astronomer at a very early age. Uh, so, yes. yeah. And I remember I fell out of a tree once <laughs> and, the, you know, I was climbing a branch. It was a big trunk and it cracked. And I remember hitting the ground. Uh, so, I mean, if it doesn't sound like you hit your head and blacked out or anything like that. Because that doesn't make sense. No, because it was one minute I'm up there, and then the next thing I know, I'm I'm waking up, like, like at uh -huh. least six feet away. And so, what did you think? I mean, did you? Did um, you... I I didn't understand it, but I knew I didn't fall. I knew I didn't fall out of it, and I didn't understand what happened. And hmm. in a sense, I kind of forgot about it. Okay, I kind yeah. of forgot about that it even well, happened. Did you, have, did you have any dreams at that point about, you know? No, being... what I was doing was I was, uh, like, you know, when we were being sent to bed, um, I would get out of bed and I would just l look out the window and just look at the stars. And I I started, I would start crying because I would, I felt like I was left behind in a sense. And I, I didn't understand how I, why I felt that way, but I just felt like, you know, I was being left behind. And here's the thing. I was one of those kids that I had a really great family, my mother and father, loving people. I, I loved my family and I was an artist because <laughs> I drew a lot and I ended up winning some contest as a kid around that time. And some man came to the house and wanted to offer, you know, me going to school. And my dad was asking me, do you want to go to school for to become an artist? And I said, uh, what does that mean? And he said, well, you would you would live in another state. I said, what? No, no. <laughs> I was like, no, um, because I love my family, I, you know. So this feeling of looking at the stars and crying and feeling lonely in a sense and and being left behind i didn't really understand it because i love my family i would never want to leave it you know leave my family ever uh, yeah. never want to run away anything like that so but i was so obsessed with ufos and 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 anything that had to do with space or you know that kind of thing and as time went on i got interested in astronomy uh, this kind of thing. But I started to go to the library and find these books about UFOs and everything and um, really start talking about it. And um, my dad, uh, you know, would always caution me to be quiet about that kind of thing. Like he says, you know, don't talk about flying saucers and stuff like that. He goes, people think you're crazy. And so by that time, it was in the 70s. And you know, I was talking about this stuff and, and good for you, my, <laughs> my hands on everything I could, uh, you know, um, as far as what was in the library, because there was no Internet, obviously. And um, there was the National Enquirer and Travis uh, Walton's story was in there. And, you know, uh, so I, I was even gravitating towards that, you know, reading those just to get my hands on anything that had to do with UFOs. 
I totally uh, sympathize because, you know, I got in this field in 86, which is a little later, but there wasn't a whole lot of books, really. I mean, there was, see, the Roswell incident, <laughs> Betty Andreessen's story, Betty and Barney Hill. I think Travis Walton had a book at some point. Yeah. But there I, really I wasn't a whole lot. Um, were you experiencing any other um, paranormal uh, things going on in your life? Like, um, were you psychic? Were you seeing um, or hearing things that nobody else could hear or see, that kind of thing? Could you know things before time? You know, any of no, the that's a good question. things. Well, um, you know, my life, I, yeah, I was deeply in, in interested in UFOs and, and astronomy. Uh, ended up. Uh, you know, like I was into, I was like a normal kid, you know, I was interested in sports and stuff like that. Cause my dad was always making sure that we played, sport, like he played with us basketball and football, everything. My dad was a very hands-on dad and he did that. And so I really loved sports. So it wasn't until like in the early eighties. Um, and I had another, uh, I had a, an experience uh, where uh, I walked out, my cat was in the backyard. I don't even know why I would have my cat outside in the backyard to begin with, because she, uh, well, she was declawed and, um, uh, I was worried about she getting attacked by any other cat or whatever. And I went out to the backyard and this was like 83. And I heard this like low kind of hum. And when I looked up, because I followed the noise, there was this huge ob oblong shaped object just hovering between the two homes. And, and the house that I was at was um, my parents' house. That was a two story. And this thing scared me. It was huge. I mean, it was big and it was just there hovering. And was this I was, daytime? Was this, at, was this during the day? This was um, kind of like right now, like dusk you know like right around now like seven o'clock right. um so it was it wasn't dark yet completely black out or anything or i wouldn't have found my cat so i was worried about going out there <laughs> right and uh so when i saw this thing i it's it startled me and my mind all of a sudden something popped in my head and I said, Oh, it's the Goodyear blimp. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, okay. So I'm safe. I'm okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I just walked out to the backyard calling my cat and I picked her up. And when I was holding her, I said to myself, I, I got fearful and I said, Oh Jesus, this thing's still there. And I slowly turned around and I just wanted to get back in the house. So I'm walking and I kind of looked up and there it was, it was still there. And I just got in the house and I put the cat down. The only person in the house was my dad. He had gotten home from work. He was kind of dozing on the couch. And I said, dad, the Goodyear blimp is going to hit the house. And the minute I said that, I thought that was the most ridiculous thing ever. And he just goes, mm-hmm. And then I don't remember what happened after that. Like, I was already into investigating UFOs, okay? And yet, why didn't I investigate? Why didn't I go out there, go under it, look at, you know, go out in the front and see the rest of it? Because a portion of it was, um, you know, it was sticking out from the house like this, but the other part was, you know, I would have to go in the front yard to see it. Well, how low do you think it was? I mean, if you had to estimate. Low. Um, I would say between 10 feet and 15 feet. <laughs> and it was about probably 10 feet away. 
All right. So that's not a blimp. Blimps don't get no. that low. <laughs> exactly. So in fact, I had forgot about that incident too until the early 90s. And I remembered that incident and I was like, I'm going to call. I, I started calling around. Um, I called Goodyear. And I talked to them. I, I said, hey, do you what's the smallest blimp you have? And would you be flying it low in a residential? And they're like, no. And they go, we don't have anything that small. And I'm like, OK. And, you know, because I was trying to get all this information to to make sure it wasn't just a, a blimp. But I think my mind was telling me that to protect me from being so scared. Is what I I figured, you know. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was just huge. Um, hmm. And how long would you say you saw it for the, what was the duration of the sighting? Uh, well, when I walked out and noticed it, cause I could hear this kind of low, a little bit of a low hum. Um, and then I walked out to the backyard, got the cat walked back and then looked up and it was like I was still there and and got in the house so you know a few minutes and and I didn't go back outside and I don't remember anything after that after telling my dad that which well, doesn't make any weird. sense because it wasn't <laughs> late it wasn't late at night it wasn't like time to go to bed or or anything it, it was like why did I why can't I, why didn't I even go out there and investigate? Because I'm an investigator, right? Well, I'm sure you know, as a researcher, this, this people don't react the way that you think they would. And you can forget about a sighting completely. Right. And, and then, well, there was, you know, because it, it didn't have an undercarriage like a blimp would. I didn't see any writing. I didn't see anything on it. It was just a, a solid, you know, piece. All right. You know, what's really telling to me is how low it is. Because when someone has a sighting that's way the heck up there, that's one thing. But if something is within 100 feet of you, <laughs> <laughs> let's face it, something happened. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was within 20 feet from it. I mean, it was right there. You know, I mean, but yeah, you know, um, it was about that time that there was all kinds of poltergeist activity in the house. Um, uh -huh. My family was talking about it. Um, I was making comments about it as well. Um, I started to get, in a sense, like I started to realize how psychic I became um like i i would know things ahead of time it, it, it and then you know of course i've had sightings uh like all my life um and i oh shoot there <laughs> um the last one I had was, um, let's see. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I don't put a lot of stock in, in what I see because I'm so busy as a MUFON investigator working on cases every day of my life. And I have, you know, every, you know, everybody's sightings in my head. I'm, I'm working on a case. Uh, you know, right now, <laughs> worked on another one last night and I closed. So wow. when I see craft and I've seen them on investigations with other people, I other people have been with me when I say, oh, look, <laughs> look at this. And they're like freaking out. And um, I will at that moment drink it all in of what I'm seeing Um and then I'll either write it down or report it myself because there's I have my own sightings in in MUFON CMS. <laughs> um, so the last one I had I think here was um, I think it was the one I was at 
I was, well, it, it's hard to remember which one is which because I, ha I would have to look for that information. But um, it was 2019, I guess, um, where I was standing out on the balcony barbecuing facing east and I knew I was looking at the sky and I go and it was dusk and I said to myself I'm going to see a UFO so I kind of looked at the sky and thought okay and then I'm barbecuing and uh, I went in the house to tell Liz to come out and look at the steak at her steak and said hey you know so she comes out there and I said, and I'm standing there looking east because I knew I was going to see something. And sure enough, there were these two white bright lights in the sky in a horizontal pattern. And I said, hey, 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 look. And she's looking at going, what the hell is that? And I, I go, well, your eyes are better than mine. I said, do you, is, the, is that two separate lights on something or is it are they individual are they individual lights or are they on something she said no it's it's attached to something and i said oh and then all of a sudden they they went like this and then dimmed and then you could just see it, it taken off whatever it was and of course she's like oh my god and i was just like i knew it was going to happen i knew it was going to be there and well, what, did that, what did that feel like i mean so because this is something I hear so often. I've had it myself. You, know, you just get this impulse to go outside. So did you? I mean, did you get a message or just ha, ha, just had no, a knowing it, it, or? It, it it it. This is this is the thing. I was already out there, right? Because I'm barbecuing, and it's a knowing. Okay, it's not a voice. It's not. It's just a knowing, and it just it it pops in your head that that knowledge that, you know, that's why I call it a knowing is that it just pops in your head and you go, Oh yeah, that, I'm, I'm going to see something. Well, well and, Donnie, I'm curious about this. Do you think that that's the ETs sending a message or do you think that's the person picking up on the presence of the ETs? Hmm. I, I, I think in my case, I would say it's me picking it up. Where do you live? Where was this? Uh, Rockland, California. And mm -hmm. that's and that's like 20 minutes east of Sacramento. Are there any bases near you? Um, um, Beale Air Force Base is to the... Um, north of me. Okay. And it's really not that far um, because I have seen many, many jets nice. flying either away uh, towards the east from them or I've seen them coming back. So, so that was your most recent sighting. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I would say that one. Um, when was that? 2019. I think it was 2019 or mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. But, but you've had more prior think, to that because it I think you mentioned because the other of one before. because the other one I think was um let's see 17 had to have been 2016 because uh we were babysitting a, a little girl for a friend and uh, picked her up at the daycare and we were in the car driving east back home on on the road um and the road kind of comes down at, a, at, at kind of like this. And um, Liz was driving and said, she started freaking out and uh, said, oh my God, what's the, what was that? <laughs> and I went, what? And I was in the passenger side and there were three white lights and they were big. And this, whatever that was, was close. And it was, it was coming from the east going west and um, I rolled down the window because I said, it's going to come right over us. And I wanted to stick my head out. And um, so I'm looking at this thing and 
the white light, the three white lights were like in a horizontal pattern coming at us. When I put my head out the window, I watched it and it had like a, flu, uh, a, a fuselage in the middle, right? And it seemed triangular shaped, but the point was in the back. And when it flew over, I'm watching it and the what would have been part of the triangular part was translucent. It was kind of see-through. And I was like, what the hell is that? You know, like, so, I mean, the, the, the fuselage part was solid looking and it had like three white lights, but. No, other than the white lights, what, what uh, was the fuselage silver, gray, white, what? Kind of silverish. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was so focused on the fact that whatever the triangular part of that section seemed see-through and I was, it didn't make sense to me. Okay. I want to, I want to ask you a really important question here. Um, what, how did you get involved with researching UFOs? What was your first move into that? In other words, did you sit down and research it from reading other cases first and then thinking about it and then how did you start contacting people or having them call call you to talk about their contact so um so back in the 70s it was around 1977 um betty hill uh she had her address in the book and I reached out to her. I wrote her a letter okay. and I said, Hey, I, uh, I just told her that I'm, I'm really interested in UFOs and you know, like my dad's really telling me to stop, stop it already. <laughs> stop <laughs> it. Cause when I was graduating out of high school, my dad said, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want to be a UFO investigator. And he said, Oh, geez. You know that I'm talking, he goes, I'm talking about a real job, you know, real life, this kind of thing. And when I was explaining that to Betty, she just said, you know, follow your heart. And that was in 77. And then she shared with me something that happened where she lived uh, about a, a black box that fell on uh, that came down in, into a pond and the, the farmer's dog died and all this. And I saved her letter. I still have it. Um, she sent me a Christmas card that year. I still have that. Um, wow. cause she just told me, follow your heart. You know, if this is something you want to do, don't, it doesn't matter what anyone else is telling you. And I said, well, thank you. You know, she said, just have, believe in yourself. She was just giving me a pep talk about just do it. And I said, okay. And then, um, when I went to work for Peterbilt Motors in 1979, um, I was talking, I had met this uh, other, this guy that was also interested in UFOs. And I started talking about UFOs to people. Somebody came up to me and said, hey, there's a guy on the first shift that wants to talk to you uh, about his UFO sighting when he was in the Navy. And I said, oh, yes, I want to talk with him. So I met him. I came in early to talk with him. And he gave me as a gift, um, Flying so a copy of Flying Saucer Review, which is a publication overseas. And um, he told me about his sighting while he was in the Navy on a ship uh, about this UFO that came out of the water when him and another guy were on watch. And it was really exciting because it, it was, I was trying to get the word out that I was interested in, in uh, UFOs and everything. And, and so it was exciting for me because I was only like around 20 years old or so. And, you know, that someone uh, like that who was in the Navy and everything wanted to share his, his story with me. So that's well, how it kind of. At this point, were you thinking that you yourself have had contact or been taken on board? Anything like that? You weren't mm -hmm. not connecting the dots I yet? Was, <laughs> no, because I was so interested in finding out uh, 
you know, other people, what, what are they, what are they experiencing? And that's why I thought, you know, all the contactee stuff, I just kept thinking my early thoughts in those days was that they would have the key. They, they are talking about this and that, you know, and uh, that was important to me because I was kind of following uh, Jacques Vallée's work because uh, I found uh, I, his, I checked out his book, um, Passport to Mongonia out of the library. And I was really studying all that and, and, re- and was fascinated that it went so far back in history. So um, in 1979, I went to work for um, Peterbilt Motors and that's when I talked to that guy. But the year before in 1978, I was a manager of a gas station and I was pretty young. I was like 19, I guess. And um, I was uh, the manager. So I had to get the money every day and take it to the bank as a merchant. And I rode a motorcycle at that time. And so I got the bag and I drove, I, I rode my motorcycle to Wells Fargo down the road. And in those days, there was no such thing as ATMs. And so I had to get to the bank before three because the banks closed at three o'clock. So I got there and I was a few minutes late. I was like, oh no, I'm banging on the door. You guys let me in, let me in. I have the bag of money. And they go, oh yeah, come on in. So I finished the bank business and I was off work and it had rained earlier that morning. And so I was excited about being off work because I'm going to go hang out with friends. And I was walked over to my motorcycle. No one's around. The bank is closed. There's no ATM. There's no reason for anyone to be around the bank. Right. So Mm -hmm. I'm just there by myself. And I was getting ready to put my helmet on and I was facing east and I was putting my, my helmet on when I saw two, uh, this was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Um, and blue skies, and I saw two objects coming from the east going west. And so it's coming towards me. And they looked disc shaped. And they were big. They were probably uh, probably the size of a dime at arm's length, one of them. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? And I was watching. And I took my helmet back off. And I'm watching. And they're coming now towards me. They look disc shaped from that angle. When they came over me, I watched them fly right overhead, 90 degrees, and they were circular. They weren't disc shaped because they were over my head now and I could see the shape. And they were like, one was a little bit uh, flying before the other. So, you know, they weren't like side by side, but one was like in the front. And no wings, no sound no windows, no nothing. And they were silver and the sun uh, was glinting off them. I ended up putting in a report because I was getting um, some publications from APRO and I got a hold of them and asked for, again, there's no internet. So they sent me, I told them I had a sighting and I want to report it. So they sent me a paper um, report, right? And I filled in my report and drew the picture and I sent it into APRO. Nice. So that was in 78. And that was when I realized those weren't any anything identifiable to me. So, yeah. So that, that and then, you know, like, My life just took off. I started, I got in contact with Betty and Drace and Luca, started writing her letters. She was writing me back because again, there's no internet. So we're writing letters, right? And I still have her, some of her letters. Um, And uh, I and her daughter, Becky, started later on before Becky died. Because Becky's around my age, or was, and she, 
I was contacting her and she ended up doing uh, this uh, alien writing paper for me. It was pretty cool. I still have it. But yeah, so I was just, so in the 90s, you know, I was in contact with Betty and Drace and Luca and um, going to some of the, uh, here in California in the northern part, uh, we, we had UFO conventions in the 80s. I was going there. I finally got to met, meet Betty Hill in person. I took a picture of her because I was like, oh, hey, hi, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Bud Hopkins was there, that kind of thing in the 80s. Um, so I was just knee deep in this, um, not really, you know, like I knew in the back of my mind something happened when I was 11, and I never gave that up after after I re-remembered it. And I, are you you remember the UFO magazine? It was being published down in Southern California. I remember. Yep. <laughs> I I was I subscribed to that, Me and too. <laughs> in 1990. Helen Billings was um, featured in the magazine as a hypnotherapist, and she was right here in the Berkeley area. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, I should go see her and find out what the hell happened to me. Right? <laughs> well, when well, did you remember that experience at age 11? When did that come back to you? Um, probably in the 80s. I think when, after I had that big, blimp like sighting right. i think back then that's when i think i remembered that so in the and back was, of your mind you always kind of knew that there was something more going well, on i knew you. i knew <laughs> something strange happened something right. that didn't make sense but i didn't know what and i never i never wanted you know, there's people that say, oh, I wish I was abducted. And I said, what? No, <laughs> no. Um, I never wanted to think that that happened to me. Right. Never thought of that. Never thought about that. And, and but when I found out about Helen being a hypnotherapist here and actually being featured in UFO magazine, I thought, hey, she would be safe someone safe to go to that wouldn't think I was crazy. Cause if you just went to just anybody back in those days, that was something that I always wondered, you know, like I can't just go to anybody. I don't want them to think I'm nuts or not believe me or, or, you know what I mean? Like I wanted someone to be open-minded. Yeah, sure. That's a real danger. I did. I've talked to people who've ended up in mental institutions from their own family <laughs> for just, yeah. Talking. They had witnesses to support their story. Still, their family's like, nope. My dad, you know, you mentioned yours wasn't receptive. My dad was not at all receptive. You know, Dolly's mom was not either. Uh, so did you ever ask your parents if they had encounters? Um, you know what's so funny? Um, I, I, I just want to jump forward ahead here now that you brought this up. Uh, when I moved to Oregon and became the chief investigator out there for MUFON in 2008, and uh, in, I think it was 2009, possibly 2008, 2009, I came home, I flew back to Northern California for Christmas. And I'm one of those fun people that like to sit there and buy a bunch of these gifts um, and then play games like wrap them up and say, Hey, um, you know, I got all these gift cards and we're going to play a game. Well, the game was, I told my family members create a UFO sighting or experience and whoever creates the best one wins the grand prize. Right. And it was so Sneaky. much fun. <laughs> huh? Sneaky. <laughs> so, they all, I said, just whatever comes to mind, whatever. And you know who had the best one? My dad. He huh. talked about going for a walk and he always walked. We, I used to walk with him. He used to always go walk in a neighborhood. He talked about walking one night and seeing a strange object and realizing that it was something 
not like a plane or anything. And he, he just talked about kind of hiding and it was coming down and shining a light on him and all this. And it was so interesting that my father, who always telling me, stop talking about this crazy stuff, you know, <laughs> that he came up with this. And I, in my back of my head, wondered, is this, because he was, had no interest in this at all. But just the way he presented it, you know what I mean? Hmm. But I never did ask them anything. My mom always says, how come I never see nothing? <laughs> So I know she never consciously remembers anything, but okay, well, I'm dying to know you did a regression. Yeah. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> no. Yeah. What happened with Hel Helen Billings, Billingsley? Billings. Billings. So in 1990, I went to her, scheduled an appointment and I was nervous. I was scared. And I just told her, this is the first time I've ever been to a hypnotherapist, so I don't know what to expect. She goes, no, just relax. And she's very good. And, uh, you know, she, I, I laid down on this couch and, uh, you know, she count me down and all that. And she was, I told her I wanted to find out what happened to me. Like, you know, I kind of just told her that, I don't even remember what I told her, it's so long ago, but I just wanted to explore that incident when I was 11, she could not, she said, you're being blocked. And it was just like, I couldn't like, I just couldn't see anything. It was like black. And she said to me, all right, I'm bringing you out. And then she said, either your mind is blocking it out because you're, you know, maybe fearful of something or, or something else is blocking you. And I said, oh, so there's no way to break through that. She goes, well, let's try a few different things. So she put me back down and I'll never forget this. She says to me, when was the first time you saw a UFO? Well, I remember, but that's not what I said. I said, and I could see it in my mind's eye. I was standing on a ledge overlooking a desert floor. And there was a long cylindrical object on the desert floor. And I started talking about the canoe people. <laughs> and I saw myself as this Native American boy. And she started to ask me you know, questions about, you know, who I was and when was this, um, I don't know, early, early 1800s or late 1700s. I don't know. It was something wow. like that. And she said, well, who are you? And, and I said, I was the chief's son and that these star people that we would call canoe people, because they came in canoes, long canoes, uh, would talk to my father, who was the chief. Well, that's and certainly interesting. That, I guess that I, would be the first. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was like, because you know, you're you're awake, and then you're you're hearing yourself, but I could see it in my mind's eye. You know, like I could see what I was talking about. I could see me, who I was then, and all that, and. She asks, she says to me, who do you know in this life that you knew in that life? And immediately I saw that I had a baby brother who is my nephew today in this life, who I, I just, I, I huh. adore. I have this very deep connection. Okay. Wow. And when she told me that I told her who it was and I started crying and then it brought me out of hypnosis and I felt, I realized I was crying and I was embarrassed. I said, I'm sorry. And she said, no, no, no. And she said, no, that's, you love him. Love transcends, you know, time. And she was trying to explain to me that that's very real, that, that, 
love that you have for that person back then and now is the same soul. And because I was like, wow, you know, like that was another time. <laughs> Surprise. And she said, well, it, it's it's a part of who you were, you know, like you, you were that person, you know, and that's what you remember. And she says, when you have a deep emotion like that, that's how you know, because I was saying, how do I know that that's real? And she said, because of the emotion and that love, she says, is that love for him real to you? I said, absolutely. I love this guy, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I was really like, wow. And you know, what's so interesting is when I was 11, when that incident happened and I told you I was an artist and I love drawing stuff. I was drawing a Native American scene over and over. I still even have them. I still have these drawings from then. I was drawing Native American life, um, you know, like our teepees by a river. And there was, you know, we put a, an animal on a spit because, you know, we were, that's our food. It just, and it was always detailed. And so that was a trip to me, you know. Yeah, that's amazing because at that age I was drawing shipwrecks and I, I later, you know, recalled being on shipwrecks in the past life, but very detailed, the ship's going down and everything. <laughs> I've got every shipwreck book you can find. <laughs> I think that's a, a way to um, show your past life. Um, little, little kids will draw what they were, but is that all you recalled under hypnosis? Did you re ever get back to the... She tried to go again and, and it just couldn't um couldn't get past that um and it wasn't until 2019 i went to Lori mcdonald who is a hypnotherapist here in sacramento and she's a certified mufon hypnotherapist and i went to her and uh boy uh, it took a couple of uh, it took a couple of uh, visits to finally, you know, like break through. But we did, and it was a long session. Um, and I asked her if I could tape record it, and she said yes. And so when I went back to listen to it, you know, you, I could almost hear you know, her exasperation of, you know, trying to reword things. And then when she finally reworded something, man, it opened up my brain or something, my mind. And I found myself laying on a table and some little entity was at my foot feet. Hmm. Okay. And Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Let's do our station break real quick. Preston. All right. We're one hour in. Yeah, we're one hour in. Just for all of you who are listening, thank you very much. You're watching The Light Gate. I'm your host, Preston Dennett. My co-host is Dolly Safran. Our amazing guest is Dev Rooney. This is episode number four, and we're streaming live on several platforms, including United Public Radio Network and UFO Paranormal Radio Network. And at 107.7... FM and 105.3 in the beautiful city of New Orleans. New, New Orleans. Yes, I'll get we it right also where <laughs> broadcast out on uh, Roku, and there's several other programs uh, that we're out on as well. Uh, if you're in Roku listening to us live, I know you can't chat with us, um, but others who are in uh, YouTube and the Light Gate and other places can ask questions. And if you do, they'll, we'll put them up and ask. Uh, Dev, questions for y'all? And okay, so Dev. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to the questions soon, but. Yeah. <laughs> Dev, okay, so you were on a table. Okay. What yeah. was happening? What was happening? Um, so I was laying there and I really, I really couldn't move. I could move my eyes. And I was looking down and, um, 
I could see this little bean, this little, you know, when I looked at it and I'm supposed to be 11, right? I wasn't afraid of it. I was, um, I kind of feel sorry for it because it wasn't a gray. It was a small entity with a round, kind of a roundish head and round eyes and a bigger, a little bigger than ours. Um, and the nose area was like scrunched up. So like when, when Lori was asking me to, to describe it, I'm looking at it. I said, well, it's a short uh, squished because I was so focused on this part of its face because it was kind of wrinkly, uh, uh, squished or something. It was just, I felt sorry for it. I thought, oh, you poor thing, you know, because I kept thinking something happened to it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like its face is all messed up, right? Like, I don't know if that was a defect I was thinking because, you know, when you're 11, you don't, you know, I, I, I felt sorry for it because I thought it got hurt or it, it had a problem with its face because it's all smished right here. Like, oh. kind of, uh, uh, like wavy lines right here where the nose is supposed to be, I guess. And I said to it, and it's looking at me and I said, what am I doing here? And I don't remember if I was verbally saying that. But I, I asked, what, what am I doing here? And he had said, well, you know. And uh, I was kind of like, hmm. And he said, we've been together before. And so I got the impression that it was like watching me grow or something, you know, like get older, like they've been around. And so as I'm looking at him out of my peripheral view, something is coming on my left, coming down. And I can't move my head, but I can move my eyes. And so as this thing is doing this, I'm looking and it's this big bubulous head type thing. Um, but the neck, the neck was really skinny. And I kept thinking, I was looking at the neck going, how does that neck holding up that big head? <laughs> and I, I, I knew it was kind of thin, thin. And um, in the back of my mind, I guess I thought it was a gigantic spider. Because that head had a, like a black eye and, and and it was trying to come down to my face. And I, I, in a sense, that was enough for me. <laughs> I was like, and then I just got out of it, you know, just came out of um, hypnosis. And when I was waking up, I was like, thinking, holy crap, right? You know, like, you know, like I was taken and I was like, wow, man, I can't believe this. And, um, and I looked at Lori and I says, is this bullshit or what? <laughs> I had said that, right? Cause I wondered, you know, <sighs> have you ever rectified the feelings that you had when you were younger sitting on a roof? waiting for something to come and you felt lonely and really wanted something to happen. And then your experience that you just remembered on board. In other words, um, a lot of people that I talk to tell me they're, they're afraid of not knowing. Okay. But then once they do know it levels them off. Okay. And they see it better for what it really was, what was really going on. And I'm asking you, what are your feelings about that? How, how do you feel about those experiences, putting them all together? Well, so after I had said that to Lori, you know, is this bullshit? She said no. And then she went into, a, you know, 
explaining, and it's in the book uh, at the last chapter, what she had said, um, but she was trying to explain to me that I demonstrated this and this and this, whatever, but I, you know, I heard her, but I wasn't like comprehending all that because it wasn't important because at that moment I'm thinking, holy crap, I just saw two different alien type creatures and man, because for the first time in my life, it was like, now I know. And so I said to her, well, we've been under a long time. I need to use the restroom. So I went down the hall of her office and, um, and used the restroom. And as I was washing my hands and I'm looking in the mirror and I could see it in my mind's eye. I just, the, the, the hair on my arms, which I barely have any, but it just stood up this, I got this, you know, creepy feeling like, and I just looked at myself in the mirror, like, wow. And I asked myself, do I really want to know more? I really don't. I, 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 I don't. Um, and because Lori has asked me after the fact if I wanted to do more regressions to find out more. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. But this is what was interesting. See, Lori McDonald is a friend of mine as well. We, uh, we hang out. Okay. And um, so when I went when I went to that second regression with her and then shortly after that, I guess it was um, Christmas time and she was having a, a party with a few friends and we were there. And what happened to that the day before that uh, I was delivering medication uh, to a senior center mm -hmm. and um I was walking in the door when I looked down and I saw this large praying mantis on the ground. And I was like, looking at it going, oh man, you're going to get stepped on. So I tried to find a twig to move it, right? Move it out of the way. <laughs> and it was fighting me. And, you know, it was, <laughs> I was like, come on. It was creeping me out. Okay. Okay. And it, I was going, come on, I'm trying to save your life. And I'm pushing it and it flipped over on its back and it's bubulous body. Oh, it was just thick. And, and I was like, oh, and immediately my mind went back to that creature. Right. Oh, wow. And I knew, oh shit, that wasn't a spider. That was like a praying mantis type. Right. It was like a, like that. Cause I didn't know what a praying mantis was at 11. We, I just never saw one. I never even heard of a praying mantis at 11. I thought it was a spider and my entire life I've had arachnophobia so bad that I don't even open up my window here in my office because one time a spider came down onto my neck and I lost it. <laughs> um, so I ended up moving that that praying mantis out of there and it was just it bothered me. And so I was going to Lori's party the next uh day or two and I was sitting on the couch and I was trying to get her attention because I wanted to tell her about what I just told you. And I told her how it bothered me. And she said, Well, maybe we should do another session and and find out what's going on there. And I almost started crying. I mean, I was holding, the tears were starting uh -huh. to come out at this party. And I'm not a crier, right? Like I don't, but I was, it, I was ready to start bawling right there at the party, right? And I just told her, okay, we'll talk about it later. And I was just trying to not just burst out in tears. So you never did another regression? No, I just, I'm so busy. It's so crazy. <laughs> just, um, and I wasn't sure if I really wanted to find out. 
I wasn't ready to go in, into it all again. Well, well, going back to what you did recall, you know, when you saw this little guy, did you see the color of his eyes? Weren't one, one the round eyes? Yeah. The, uh, his eyes were, um, well, bigger than mine. Um, what, what on his color? head, on his head, the, they're black. All right. In the middle. But there was a little bit of white. Okay. And I, I think because he didn't look, he to me, at, as a kid, I didn't look at him as a monster or a creature. It, 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 he didn't look too crazy. You know what I mean? Like this other thing that was coming down on my face. Um, so at the time you did this regression, though, you certainly heard of grays. Yeah. Right? So yeah. you're after you wake up and you're thinking back, was this, would you classify him as a gray? No, no, I wouldn't. Yeah. Because Gray's, Gray's, the head is so much larger and the way it's shaped. Right. His head wasn't like that. And and uh, his eyes weren't like those black, you know what I mean? No. Right. Nothing like the. I have a question for you. We have uh, Penny Rummel on uh, the light gate right now, and she's watching you. And she wants to know that, did you ever have any uh, thoughts in your head like they were talking to you, you know, that were not your thoughts? In other words, were you ever realizing that they were communicating with you at all? Uh, no, because when I was laying there um, and looking at that little guy, um, I was talking to it. I was asking questions and, and it, in a sense, answered me, not in great detail, but because when that other creature was coming towards me, my face, um, I think it freaked me out a little bit. And I just got out of regression because the second regression was trying to go and remember what happened in the 1983 blimp thing. So, and that was a big block. Um, but yeah, so I didn't go back to when I was on that table with okay. those two entities. So it, it, there wasn't a lot of time and there wasn't a lot of information that came through because I somehow brought myself out of it. Did you see the room at all or anything around you? No, no. Because it was it was quick. Because like I said, a lot of that time she was trying so hard to get through that block. Right. And um, because I was seeing like this blue color, this this blue color that almost is not identifiable. You know what I mean? Like it was hard um. to it was hard to describe. But this blue swirling light um, was, and I was kind of hyperventilating a little bit. Was it coming so, down over your body? No, it was when she was trying to break through the block. That's what I was experiencing, this blue light. And there was a little bit of... Um, like I was hyperventilating a little bit, like getting a little anxious. Um, and she was trying to calm me down, you know, so I don't know what that blue light was about that color, mm -hmm. but it, she asked me, what did you, what do you feel about that color? I go, it's beautiful. I love that color. In fact, I, I, I love that. I love blue. I love the color blue. And that color was so, delicious <laughs> it was beautiful it was oh. you know what i mean like it was hard to describe but so do you feel that regression afterwards was did you feel better afterwards is that something you it was nice was it was nice to know that it was the block was I, she was finally able to get through the block and what happened all right that well, it was nice to, it, it it was nice to finally know and but yet i don't want to know anymore about what what was going no, on there I'm not. <laughs> you uh, don't 
Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about this because you've you've still been investigating. You have years of it under your belt now, right? So I know you've formed oh, yeah. opinions, okay, mm -hmm. about these investigations and what you've learned all these years. Um, are you um, as, at odds with your experiences versus knowing what's going on in the in the field of ufology? Or I mean, how do you feel about all that? What's on well, your you know how I my book uh because I think you read it um, about the fact that um, I was interested in, because early on I was interested in, in the, and I know that your, your channel doesn't use that word abduction, but we did back in the early days of the abduction phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the contactee portion of it, um, because there are many people that I interview for my cases that talk about them being, and they use that word abducted. I don't use it. I don't even bring it up. I just tell them what, well, what did you experience? Right. What did you see and experience? I don't use, I never, as a MUFON investigator, I never tell them, oh, you were abducted. <laughs> right. Never. No, never. Investigators do not do that. You have no. to be objective. That's right. I just tell them, well, what do you remember seeing? What do you remember experiencing? But like I said, in the beginning, because I've been investigating UFOs for decades and I've had my own sightings and my own experiences as far as paranormal and a lot of stuff, a lot of psychic stuff going on. But, you know, here's the thing. It started to transition over to where I didn't, I wasn't so much into that whole contactee stuff. I was so fascinated. And that's why my book, the, ch the chapters I wanted to put in 30 cases of mine, close encounters. And I wanted to, in my book, put them and classify them as the different types. So like every, like every chapter, like, um, triangular UFOs, rectangular UFOs, disc shape, and then other types. I got more fascinated by the, in a sense, just the shape of these UFOs that people were seeing. Mm -hmm. I was so fascinated with that. That is interesting, isn't it? There's just mm -hmm. so many different shapes. I've heard them all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, mostly saucer. Would you say that that's true with you? Most people describe saucers or how, how would you break it down? Well, you know, and that's the interesting thing. I love historical cases that come in because it's a lot of close encounters of craft, right? We get a lot right now, like it's more orbs, a lot of orbs. Everybody sees orbs, you know, it's all or a lot of orbs, uh, mostly. And not like back in the day where, you know, there's all these craft being seen. So it, it, it's a juicy case when someone tells me, oh, back in, you know, 1980 or, you know, whatever, I, <laughs> we saw this huge and they get into this description because it's close encounter. It's within 500 feet. They start describing what they saw of this craft and yeah. boy, I'm salivating on those cases. I love it. You know, you whistleblowers ever contact you? Whistleblowers. There was one case that came in, but MUFON took it. Let's put it that way. Uh -huh. Okay. What would you say is your favorite case? Um, gosh, I have so many. Yeah, um, people always ask me that, and I'm like, because mm. <laughs> it's hard to pick, but a good one, you know, one that you know impressed you. I sent you a picture. I don't know if you got it. Yeah, I don't know if we can put it up because we are had technical difficulties. Oh, that's fine. So that's fine. So, and, um, so this you're, one case, so this one case um, that, uh, let me see, I could even show you the picture. Um, because this is why it's one of my favorites, because it's almost so unusual. So, Let's see. Um, so this guy in uh, 
1992. He was about 16 years old at the time. And he was, uh, they lived up in railroad flats and it's a very rural area. In fact, I did a live investigation um, because he reported it as a man, but this happened when he was a 16 year old. Okay. Right. So I did do a live investigation and I traveled up there to the rural uh, property. <laughs> and boy, was it rural because my car almost didn't make it. <laughs> but anyway, so he ended up talking about him and his mother uh, one night went outside the house um, to smoke a cigarette and they were both not supposed to be smoking. <laughs> his, father, his father was in the shower. So they were like up against the house and there was like a tree there and um, they're smoking a cigarette and you know, the stars are out and all of a sudden his mother is hitting him in the arm and she's looking up with this incredulous look. Right. And he fall, looks at her and looks at what she's looking at. And it was a huge triangular shaped object above the tree. And what he was saying that it was, um, 50 feet by 50 feet on air on, on all three, uh, sides and underneath was a blue light. And this is what, when he said this, I can almost imagine because again, this blue color comes into play. He talks about, there was a blue light on each corner of the triangle. And he said the blue, there's a bigger light in the middle and it was blue. And he said it was swirling, but the blue, he said he almost couldn't, he goes, I can't even tell you the color blue that it was. It's like, he says, there's no blue color like that on earth. And I, that just hit me. You know what I mean? Like in some way, like, and I thought to myself, I kind of know what he means, but anyway, so <laughs> he, uh, he said, there it was just hovering. And I said, well, how high was it? He said, maybe a hundred feet, maybe less. And I said, wow. And so when I did go on the property, I stood by the tree and we were looking up at, and, you know, I could see like how high it was and everything. And I was like, wow, this thing was low. But anyway, he said, that thing was just hovering and then there was an explosion like of light and it transformed into that can you see that oh yeah all right um, for those who can't see it it looks like a daisy sort of but with multicolored petals in the black center yeah that's beautiful he said it was beautiful. He said they were tubes of light and they were neon colored. He said, but that doesn't even describe. He says neon is not even, he goes, that's not even, that doesn't even cover it, cover it. You know, he goes, these, these colors were just amazing. And they were tubes of light like neon, he said. And then his mother screams out her husband's name because that startled her because it was a triangular shape craft and then boom into this thing. And it just was too freaky for her. So she screams out her husband's name. He hears her cause he's in the shower right there. <laughs> and he comes busting through the, uh, the reporting person, the guy who was a 16 year old at the time said, I could hear my father running through the house. And the minute he busts out the door to come outside, because he goes, I wasn't taking my eyes off of that thing. That thing just went and morphed into a little red ball of light and then 
took off. The, that's what the father saw. And I asked him, did you, what else did you see? You just, what did you see? He said, I saw a red light <laughs> take off. And I just said, okay. But he didn't see what the mother and the son had saw. And so this thing transformed into three different things. It was, it was a triangle. Then it was that burst of light or explosion or something, plasma. And then it morphed into this red light and zipped off. Yeah, there's some interesting things about that because clearly it's aware that the father is running out because <laughs> right when it, he does, boink, it's gone. And I feel like they put on a display sometimes. I mean, why? Why so beautiful? No, I know that feeling because I've seen those lights are prismatic almost with the intensity um, that's hard to describe. Uh, yeah. It, so that's why that is one of my favorite cases. But here's the interesting thing about that case. That wasn't all that happened. So after it took off, they were looking around for it, didn't come back. He said, because on the property, he was staying in a little trailer, like about 50 feet away from, hey, 30 feet away from the, the main house, right? Mm -hmm. The the 16-year-old, the, the right. reporting person. He said, at that time, I had this little trailer that I called my own. He, he stayed in there. He, he slept in there and everything. So he went in to go to bed that night. And he said, as he was laying there in bed, his whole trailer lit up like daylight. And the, he looked out and, the, and he said, I could look out the window of his trailer and the white light just engulfed everything. It was, he said, I looked out, it was all white. It scared him and he hunkered down and he was thinking, oh my God, what is this? And he said, I'm going to grab my gun because he had a gun, I guess a rifle or something. And he said, when he went to go look for it, he realized, oh man, it's in the house. So his idea was, I am going to run out of here and get the gun because <laughs> he was scared. He said, I was hunkering down by the latch, getting ready to find the courage to open it up and dart across the lawn uh, the yard to the to the main house and when he did he opened the door and he ran out and he stopped dead in the yard and because the light was gone mm. Mm. and um so yeah you know he ended up going back in and going back to bed but um, I think he ended up having something, some kind of um, a mark or something on his yeah, head. I was or... gonna say he's probably taken because with a, a, a sighting, it's an introduction to and then a, a second one. <laughs> that's a pattern we see. Which was, was within the same night. Exactly. Later that night. And so he said he had some kind of something here. <clears throat> but um, yeah, it was a fascinating case. And I made sure I put it in the book. <laughs> well, I do want to get to some of the questions, but I do have, want to ask one thing quick, because I know you touched upon this, uh, is going to, or yeah, the, the Monroe Institute? Yes. Because I'm fascinated with OBEs and out-of-body experiences and astral projection and all that. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience with that. So in the 90s, um, you know, I was having um, some, uh, I was having some sightings, some, a lot of paranormal activity, a lot of, um, I was able to um, know things that were going to happen ahead of time, all this stuff. And I was reading the uh, Robert Monroe's book there. He had two of them, I guess. And I read, read them both because I felt like at night I was like leaving my body because when I started to become aware of it, 
I would just be like, boom. And then I would, <laughs> and then I would be like, I just fell into my body, right? That's crazy. <laughs> so, so I got, I started to read the Renro, uh, Bob Monroe's uh, books. And so in 1996, I went to the, uh, to the Monroe Institute. I flew there and stayed there a week <clears throat> um, and did their gateway program. What was interesting is when you, um, when you fill out the application, um, it, they ask you, what's your interest? And I said, UFOs. <laughs> and I always wondered what that meant. I didn't understand why they were, they were asking that. Well, I found out when I got there. Um, so when you get to the Monroe Institute, they take away your watch. They don't want you to know what time it is because time doesn't exist. And that's what they're trying to teach you. And I already knew that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you didn't know what time it was. So they, you know, you checked in, they took away your watch and made sure that you didn't have an alarm clock or any kind of clocks. And when they showed me my room, um, I started putting my stuff away and they said, your roommate will be here shortly. So my roommate was another woman and um she came in and I introduced myself and she did the same. And um, she, we started, we, we realized that we both were into UFOs. <laughs> and I said, what? I said, is that's why they ask us, uh, you know, what we're interested in because they want to put like-minded people together. So they put me with the other person that was interested in UFOs at that time during that week. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, did you end up having OBEs then? Um, they taught us a bunch of tools to use. Um, uh, what I really liked uh, was uh, one evening we were to go into the Nancy Penn building on the property. And um, we had a special guest. Joe McMoneagle, and he taught us that night how to do remote viewing, and um, I'd go home and practice that. So that was really cool, and uh, it was it was cool. I, I I had a lot of fun doing that. But the OBEs, you know, they teach you how to go out, and we have a lot of um, um, sessions of doing that, and then in between that. Uh, we would have to go and ground ourselves. We'd have to go outside, kind of walk around on the grass, hug a tree, that kind of thing. Cause we were always going in, you know, doing these experiments and stuff. And I'll never forget. Uh, I saw myself in New York city hmm. and I had a, a, like a premonition that, because I had never been to New York City. I'm from California. I'm, I'm, I, I never really traveled to the East Coast. <clears throat> and um, so what was interesting was I knew it was New York City because I was up high and I could see the building. So I saw the, the uh, Empire State Building type thing and, and all that. And um, what was interesting was then the year after that, um, some of my friends, we were getting together. We were talking about taking a trip to New York. And I had totally forgot about what I had experienced at the Monroe Institute. And it wasn't until we got there to New York, because uh, there was four of us that went on vacation together. And uh, I remember standing there uh, and looking up at that building. And immediately I remembered seeing that from a different perspective at the Monroe Institute, I was kind of in the air. Kind like, of interesting, yeah. <laughs> uh, not in the air, like in an airplane or anything, but me in the air. Wow. Yeah. But Have you in tried, reality, yeah, seeing that. Do you try to OBE still now? Do you meditate? Do you I meditate <laughs> because um, I was doing some healing um like energy healing back in the 90s and um i kind of got out of that and now i'm doing i'm getting back into that 
uh, and doing meditation and um, I'm practicing different uh, ways of doing uh, the energy healing. Okay. Um, right now. Yeah, all this stuff is related. So, so yeah. how, how do you feel about answering some questions from chat? Is that all right? Sure. Cool. All right. Let me see. I've got a couple here. Here's one from Brian Morgan. Uh, so this might be for both you, Dev, and Dolly. Brian Morgan says, a serious question I have is, might there be a recommendation for how to make contact? Over the years, I've seen things high up in the sky, but nothing close up. So yeah, I've got some thoughts on that. What about you, Dev? <sighs> um, what can he do? Because he want, what, what he's saying is he wants to see something close up, right? Yeah. My impression is, um, I think if your intention is out there and you can ask, I think that you can ask for something like that to happen. Absolutely. That's my that's my impression yeah. of of that kind of a scenario. Right. Is that if you're seeing something from a distance, I think that you can um, put your intention in out there and just ask for them to get you know come closer. Right. That's that's what I would say. What about you, Dolly? Um, well, ETs are wide open psychic, and uh, one of their messages is that they would like everybody here to start working on that and um, develop your your intuition, your psychic ability. And um, when you do that, that helps you make a connection with them. They will hear you better. In other words, you'll be able to single them out. And uh, so you just, every night before you go to bed, you tell yourself, I'm, I'm gonna ask one question tonight before I go into you know dream sleep or lucid dreaming or even OBE. And that is just that um, if you can hear me, give me uh, something back to let me know that we're going to connect. And you keep trying that until you actually start to make a connection. You have to be very careful when you do that, though, because there's lots of energy on this planet and not all of it's really good. So mm -hmm. if you are trying to contact an ET, you have to verify it, that it is ET contacting you. And there are ways to do that. And uh, I would suggest that you write down everything you experience and you keep reading, you know, wait a week and then we go back and read over what you've just experienced and then uh, pinpoint signal in on what it is you're hearing and just make it sure it's verifiable. In other words, you won't accept anything negative. You, you don't want to know this, the secrets of life. You just want to have a conversation with them and see what happens and pose a question at some point and have them answer it and post something that's verifiable here. In other words, get them to tell you something so that you can verify what the answer is to here. And once you start doing that and you know you're making the connection, then you go deeper. But it has to be on the top level first. You know, it has to be very careful, walk through it, practice using your abilities, that kind of thing. Yeah, that makes total sense. I, I think you hit it on the head, Dev, it's just a matter of asking, reaching mm -hmm. out mentally, honestly. And I have a sneaky suspicion, honestly, that anyone who starts investigating this subject starts having contact. I really feel like most UFO researchers out there are, are probably contactees. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, yeah, I agree. 100%. Absolutely. You know, I, have you uh, any idea in your future um, from here forward? Are you ready to like be um, triggered to remember? Do you think there's a safe space for you to be in emotionally over this? You know, in any time in the distant future, do you crave that? Well, my belief is that sometime soon, um, we're going to be in contact and For me, it's I, I I I'm a truth seeker. Okay, all I care about is the truth. I want to know the truth about everything, and I really believe that that's going to be coming soon, in the very 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 near future. Um, 
people call that disclosure. Um, but they're going to introduce themselves and I'm fine with all that. You know, I, I'm, I stick with being a, a, a MUFON investigator because it's not just gathering data. It's not just finding out like what everyone else is seeing and, and experiencing. It's, it's beyond that. I'm a people person and I want to be there for people. I want them to be, I have had, I've done over a thousand cases since 2008 and I have talked to almost that much people. And here's the thing that doesn't even include the people that reach out to me privately. And I've always wanted to be there for them. I wanted to have them to have someone to listen to them. You got something and, called Preston about that. He feels the same way. Yes, you know? because I, they have told me many times that they didn't have anyone to talk to, that they've, whatever they've experienced or saw, they've talked to family members or even coworkers and they're laughed at or they're like, oh yeah, buddy, right. And they just told me many, many times, thank you so much for listening to me. And I always encourage, hey, if, if uh, you want to talk again, you know, reach out to me. Mm -hmm. I want to be, I want to be there for people because you're a facilitator. I, mm -hmm. That's your mission. Do you realize that? I'm serious. You're bringing out truth. You want to help people. You're keeping the conversation going. You're a facilitator. You're somebody who's uh, comfortable and easy to keep this information alive and moving forward. So that's good. You're doing a good job. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. And you know, here's the thing. Um, I, I just want to help people, you know, um, and if with my energy healing too, I want to help people. It, it's all about helping people. We have to help each other. Exactly. We all have to love each other and be there for each other. Um, and, and some people are, ha they, I tell you, there's a couple of, there's a couple of stories in here that two guys, they, it's changed their life in a negative way. And I talked to them and I, you know, it's, I, I felt so bad that they no longer are going out and doing what they loved when they had that encounter and it scared them. And I always try to tell them, you know, like I, I try to be there for them to talk with them. And I always felt bad that they, they were so scared that it really kind of ruined their lives in a way. Oh. So that I, I, I never forgot that kind of thing and just want to be there for people to be able to talk with. And I run, I run a local MUFON meeting every right. month and I encourage people. I don't have a lot. I don't really go and have a lot of speakers or anything like that. I want the group to come and talk and, tell me, you know, like, let's share the stories of their sightings, or if they have an experience they feel comfortable talking about, or let's make friends with like-minded people. I, I, that's what my group is really about. Um, as far as sharing the ET and uh, UFO stuff, but to build a community where we're there for each other, we're friends. I'm going to be having a sky watch June 24th up in Coloma and um just want to have a good time and everybody get together chat and and watch the sky that kind of thing so that's kind of what i'm about that's, that's awesome. awesome where yeah. where is this exactly i mean what's your do you have a website for that i do uh, i'm going to be putting up information um northern california mufon.com that's the website. I, I created that and I'm the webmaster. Um, also, Rockland MUFON Facebook page. If you join that, I put every meeting that's coming up for the month. I put the information there and I am going to put the information for the Skywatch, uh, the June Skywatch there as well. Okay. And like if somebody wanted to report to you, could they report to you through that website as well? Um, well, my email is there. They can reach out to me. Um, 
but we always encourage to report with MUFON.com. Right. They can report right off that website. My website also has a link directly to report. And if you're interested in becoming a, a MUFON investigator for Northern California, I also put a link there. That'll take you to the MUFON site where you can get started if you wanted to become an investigator. And you'd be on our team here in Northern California. All right. Well, we still have about 15 minutes left. So I'm hoping to ask a few more questions. And here's a question from Raul, Raul Melendez. Have you discovered, we, we did talk a little bit about this. Have you discovered that after your experiences, you are telepathic? After my experiences, I discovered I can see auras and became very telepathic. So I'm guessing, you know, do you think this is linked or do you think your own experiences with the paranormal are linked to your own experiences with UFOs? My belief is I think every human being is psychic. Yay. And <laughs> I love it. And I think that when you're dealing with this topic, somehow it opens you up, I think, to be more receptive. And here's the thing, you start to, and I, when I started to realize I was having at first like premonitions, it wasn't really premonition, it was psychic abilities. Uh, I started paying attention more. So pay attention to that, that voice that, or, or that thought that pops in. And, you know, I'm a researcher. I am an investigator, but I also like to play around with my abilities over the years, over the decades uh, with, uh, I delve deep into my past lives. I know a lot about my past lives and why I was born and who I am today. Um, I know why. Um, so I've got into past lives. I checked out the Monroe Institute for um, out of body stuff. I, um, Here's what, here's a fun fact. <laughs> so when I was younger, I used to race dirt bikes and I got in a lot of crashes and I hurt my back and my lower, my neck. And I, I really hurt myself. <laughs> Daredevil. Well, <laughs> what happened was um, in the early nineties, my neck and my back were really hurt. I was, I've been going to a chiropractor my entire adult life because of that. And I still am going. But in the early 90s, um, I needed a, a really good bed and I needed the money. So I made an intention out there. I need a really expensive bed and I need to win the money like in a casino. Right. So I put I told a friend of mine, I said, hey, let's go up to Tahoe. And she says, well, I really don't have the money. And I said, don't worry about it. And um, I said, just pack an overnight bag. And I said, she said, well, do you have money? And I said, well, not really. I've got 20 bucks. She goes, are you kidding me? <laughs> I said, no, it's going to be okay. Got gas in the tank. I got a $20 bill. <laughs> so I go up to Tahoe, right? Oh my God. I had such a splitting headache because my neck was out and uh, I was not feeling good. I have this ability. I had this ability where I could, I had to be alone. I told her, oh, what happened was uh, I bought us a, a, a hot dog for lunch and I had $7 to my name. And I told her I need to be alone to do this. So, you know, go ahead and uh, cruise around the, the casino. She said, all right, I will be back later. So I softened my focus. And as I walked through the casino, I look at the machines and I was playing dollar machines only. That was the key only dollar machines. And I came upon this machine and I said, this is the one, this is the one. So I sat down and I had cashed in the, the, the $7 into the money, right? Because <laughs> you put it in, in, in those days, you put the money in and then you pull the handle. So I put in $3 and I won a cherry and whatever gave me a, a one a dollar or two whatever and what happened was i second guessed myself and because i looked at the machine next to me and i said oh maybe it was this one and i moved over put three dollars in there won a cherry 
And I'm like, oh, wait, no, stop it. Just stop. It was this one. And I had $4 left. Because I had said to my friend, we're going to put an intention out before we had left that I'm going to win a lot of money. I said, but believe it. And she said, okay. So we did that. So there I am, $4 left to my name. And that's it. I put in $3, pulled the handle, bing, 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 won $10,000. <gasps> so, and I wasn't, I wasn't really surprised. I didn't act surprised. I kind of knew it was going to happen, but I was not feeling well because my head was going to split open. And all I'm doing is, where's the lady with the money? Come on, hurry up. <laughs> I, I want to get a room and lay down because I'm feeling nauseous and the whole bit. Anyway, here comes my friend. She goes, hey, what's going on? And I go, I won. She goes, what did you win? And I go, 10000 She goes, 10000 what? I said, $10,000. She goes, oh, my God. And so she, I just told her, here's some money. Get us a room. I, I got to go to bed. But I had known, and that has happened many, many times. I knew before that. So this psychic, this psychic premonition of knowing, um, like playing Keno, I knew what the numbers were going to be. And it would just like you know, put the numbers down, boom, boom, boom. It was just happening over and over. And I'm not a gambler. Um, so it was, it, I attributed to psychic ability and you must always, you must never second doubt yourself. Right. Never. Right. Yeah, just just accept what's coming through. That's it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, okay, it, well, it, it's, just, it's just a knowing. Yeah, that's a very cool story. It kind of confirms my suspicions. Contactees and psychic abilities go hand in hand. But here's another question, which I've never heard before. Kind of interesting. <laughs> this is from Rad Peanut, who says, I have an odd question. Are there forms of royalties in any alien groups? And if so, are there human descendants from them? I'll real quick say, no, I haven't heard of that. I don't know about you, Deb, but I'd be interested to hear if you've heard anything like that. Right. I've never heard them say, have di different duties and stuff like, oh, I'm the one who pilots the craft or. You know, you know I, I would, you know, and this is what just popped in my head. I would say there that no, it's not royalty because I don't think that an elevated species would have that kind of ego. Good job. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's so exactly right. They right. would have duties like we all do and, and for the collective, mm -hmm. right? For the, the better of, uh, of for all, right? Mm -hmm. But not royalty that in, in, in even here in in, in human as humans we shouldn't have royalty we shouldn't have royalty no mm -hmm. and I don't think any elevated being uh, race um, would have that kind of thing that's just too egotistic egotistical to me you know yeah, you good question that though <laughs> that that's that's a good question because you had a good answer. <laughs> you had a great answer. That's fantastic. All right. Well, here's another question from DGK. It says, if they, in quotes, meaning I guess the ETs, do everything with psionics, how do they avoid going extinct like the fictional Krell did? I'm not sure I know the Krell, but um, I don't know. It's an Sorry, odd no. question. Uh, I'm not sure okay. what psionics is. Yeah, what's <laughs> psionics? Yeah, can you give us um, a definition? That would be definition up. That would be technology using psychics. No, psionics. Oh. I think I don't know. Well, I again, <laughs> I would think that a higher species. Um, that that would be psychic ability. It would be second nature right and it's we the, are the ones that are not taught that we have that birthright right. in a sense that we exactly. already have that ability we're not taught that yep you're right we're we're pushed away from it actually 
we're, we're, um, we're not supposed to be using our, our innate ability. We've got the equipment, but not everybody's hooked up with it, you know. Um, and psionics, if he's referring to the fact that they can, um, they're talking about chipping you so that you become psychic and can use that ability through, um, you know, uh, mechanical means or digital means. Uh, yeah, they can do some of that. That is an actual technology that's occurring. But it's not healthy for us. It's not normal for us. We're already built with the right stuff. The only reason that I could think of that this society would do that is so that they can transmit to you things they want you to think, you know, and make you pliable to them, controllable. Uh, ETs don't act like that at all. They operate on a very open, uh, psychic level of honesty and truth. You know, they don't lie to one another. They can't. They can hear each other thinking. And uh, they, I think they kind of expect us to evolve up to that, actually. So I hope so. Yeah. Well, here's another. We still have just under 10 minutes left. Here's another question, which I think is an important one. This is from Jackie Violet. Thanks, Jackie. Her question is, why do some of us have fear more than comfort as an experiencer? This is to me and Dev, and I assume to Dolly as well. Um, I'll let you start with that one, Deb. <laughs> Why do some of us have mo fear more than comfort as an experiencer? Well, from uh, speaking for myself, I think um, when I had went to Helen in, back in 1990, knowing that I was going to go through hypnosis to, and, because my intention was to find out what had happened I was fearful because I was afraid of the unknown. I didn't know what to expect. I knew something happened. And that is par for the course with humans. You know, when we don't know something, when we don't, when something is strange, you know, it's fight or flight, right? We're, we're afraid, so we fight back or we run, and that's fear. I agree. That is, that's something that's it. Yeah, we, that's a reaction. Right. So, and then you, if you calm down enough and just put that fear aside, um, right. I, knowledge I, is power. Fear. Yeah. You can't when, be fearful to understand something inside out, you know? Right. Uh, it, but, absolutely knowledge is power. When you don't understand something and you become so afraid that you're afraid to even figure it out, that's unbelievable compounded fear. And it's encouraged in our society. I think we're, we're afraid here because of that. We're taught to be afraid every day. We like horror movies. We like to be go to ghost houses and be thrilled and you know we believe things that are absolutely untrue like the possibility that you could have zombies walking around and things like that people live in a static of fear they, they're afraid of war they're afraid of everything you know being right. shot in the street and, and they <clears throat> perpetuate it and knowledge is what brings you out of that if you understand why something is the way it is it checks your fear you can still be cautious but it helps you check your fear and put it where it belongs, you know? And well, you know, back in, um, back in 1990, when I went to see Helen Billings, um, and she couldn't, she couldn't break through my block. And when she finally brought me back out uh, for the final time, she said to me, let me ask you something. She goes, are you ready to know the truth? And I looked at her. And I said, no. So, and back in 1990, I wasn't ready. I wasn't. Yeah. And yeah. it's okay. So that you, was the answer. It's, that, it doesn't mean you're afraid of it, though. It just means that for you personally, you've chosen, you're an autonomous being. You have a right to put things in the order you wish to experience them. And everybody needs to get on board with that, you know? And if you've chosen, one of the greatest things that I keep saying is, why don't I remember? Well, you chose not to, and they've helped you not to for now. They always leave a key. They always leave a trigger for you to come into it when you're ready and not a minute before. And that has nothing to do with being afraid. It just means you're not ready right now to experience it. That's all. So, 
I hear that all the time, like a cue or something, something that will cause people to remember. Yeah, I think fear is something that we kind of, to a certain extent, are trained to do. We live our lives constantly worried and uh, yeah. fearful of, you know, where we'll get money for the next day. And fear of the unknown is a huge one. And I think fear of loss of control, this is something that I think a lot of people struggle with. And when you see something that's so different, it's pulling you out of your worldview and is absolutely foreign to your belief system, it can yeah. cause fear. Um, I, you know, when my mom passed away, I had an enormous fear of dying. <laughs> and just, I just got exhausted with it. And I finally realized, you know what? This universe is actually safe. What's the worst that can happen? You die, there's, you go to the other side. I learned that to be you know, through personal experience. Right. So ultimately, I think, Dolly, you hit it on the head. Knowledge is what will remove fear and love. When you're with someone who's, you're going through something and you have someone with you, it's much less scary. It really right. is. So, and I yeah. hate to do this now, but we are running shortly out of time. You're yeah, so you like four yep. minutes. Um, four so, minutes? Yeah, yeah, we have to pretty much wrap it up. So is there anything we didn't touch upon? Go I ahead. just wanted to say one thing. Um, it's now been three years or so since I was regressed and found out. And so three years ago, if I, when, when Lori said, oh, do you want to go back and, and, you know, explore some more? And I was like, no. And now I'm not coming now. If she was to say, Hey, Dev, let's go. Let's, let's do another regression. I would say no, not because I'm out of fear. It's because my life has now taken on many other things that I want to accomplish. Yes, UFO uh, research and investigation is key. I still am doing that. Um, but there are other things in my life that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to accomplish, and which is the energy healing, which is just a lot. There's uh, some other things, uh, other uh, projects that I'm working on um, that uh, is taking up a lot of my time. So it's not that I'm coming from a place of fear that I don't want to know. It's, it's not important. That part is not important to well, find out more. Is that you do what you need to do for you. And that's awesome that you're doing that. You know, yeah. we have to follow our own path. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Dev. I truly appreciate it. And what's the name of your book again? Can you hold it up? Yeah. It's a UFO investigator. It's on Amazon. Okay. Very awesome. cool. Very okay. nice. There we there go. There it is. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so thank you so much. I had a great time, uh, Preston and Dolly. You guys are wonderful. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate the interview and uh, had a great time. That's Enjoy. awesome. All right, well, we're going to have to end the show. I want to thank everyone for listening. You've been listening to The Light Gate. I'm Preston Dennett, your host. Our co-host, Dolly Safran. Our guest has been the wonderful Dev Rooney author of UFO Investigator. Check it out. It's got so many reviews and they're all five stars. Excellent book. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And don't forget that we've come to you from right. UPRN, coming to us from New Orleans, 105.3 and United Paranormal Network, 107.7. And we'd like to invite you all to enjoy all of the programs that they have on this network. It's awesome. We're really glad to be here with them. And thank them very much every day for the opportunity to be doing this. Dev, awesome. Thank you very, very, very thank much. You. Bye, guys. <laughs> All right. Till next time, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.